The majority of my message this morning, or the main concept of my message this morning, is going to come out of uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. And we're, in a moment, we're going to start reading in verse 8. But um, what, before we even get into that, I want to kind of use, I want to take a little bit of a moment to kind of try to set up some of the context. And I have to tell you that typically you would expect, oh, why isn't the preacher turning to Matthew 27 where Jesus is hanging on the cross? I have some of that in my message. But I just have to try to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit tells me. Amen. And the way that God speaks to me, I tell you, I don't even remember exactly where I was. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it was real clear as day. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, the dead boy that Elisha mm. laid upon and prayed for. Amen. Amen. And so that's where we're going to end up before it's all said and done. But look, the main portion, so I, this is what I want to talk to you about this morning, is this story out of Elisha. And there's multiple stories in this 2 Kings chapter 4. But I'm going to focus on two of them. But uh, there's an obvious relationship in all of these stories that connect death, which is always connected to sin, and miracles that represent a work of the Spirit, uh, replacing that death so that the problem is death, but the result of God's intervention is life. The Bible says that in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Before we look at these two stories out of 2 Kings, I just want to mention a little bit about the overall context and the setting where this prophet Elisha specifically. Now, I don't want to be too teachy, overly teachy, but at the same time, let's teach. Elisha versus Elijah, because sometimes if I'm just saying the words you may not understand exactly, depending on how long you've been studying the Bible, you might not even know that I'm talking about two different people. I want you to know this morning, our text is focused on the prophet Elisha. But what I want you to know is, is that Elisha, he's the main character in these stories, and he is the one who God dispenses life through, just as God dispenses life into humanity, into you that's watching this. God wants to dispense life into your person and into your situation. Amen. Yes. And the way that he does that in these stories is through Elisha. But just as God did that, he also used Jesus. See, God used Jesus to dispense life into your life. He, he, that opportunity is waiting for you to just receive of the truth of the gospel. Amen. The time frame of this occurrence is around 600 B.C. I'm not being too strict with the time, but that's the approximate timing of 2 Kings. It surrounds a time in Israel's history where they were the most rebellious. The repeated string of kings that rebelled against God left Israel decimated spiritually. Times had grown the worst under the leadership of a king named Ahab and during his reign. As a result of disobedience towards him, God allowed a time frame of great famine. And during that time, God introduced the great prophet Elijah with a J to combat the wickedness that was affecting the world of God's people. Elijah was Elisha's spiritual father. And the main reason that I'm even bringing Elijah up and giving you all this context is it is because I wanted to bring together all of this in a, and to show the supernatural way that God placed his calling on Elisha's life. Elijah was taken into heaven by God in a whirlwind. Now, I got to tell you, I could probably preach on the rapture right there. Because, look, there's not been many people that have been that have been brought up into heaven in such a way that Elijah was brought up in heaven. He didn't die first. You know, the word of God teaches us that Enoch was translated into heaven and he's never seen again. The Bible teaches us that Elijah did not taste death, yet he was brought up to God in a whirlwind. Hallelujah. We know that Jesus in his glorified body was ascended into heaven. The word of God teaches us that there's going to be a rapture of the church. I believe that. And that, listen, it might sound sci-fi to some people. It might sound uh, incredulous. It might sound impossible. But the word of the Lord teaches us, hallelujah, that one day Jesus is coming back for his bride. And he's going to rapture her, harpazo her out of this place. And listen, Elijah and his, uh, his bring brought up in the whirlwind is about how quick now that's going to happen. But in this particular situation, what I want you to know is this, is that as Elijah went up, something beautiful happened. As Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind and as he was being taken into heaven, 
his prophet's mantle descended. Concurrently, he's rising into the heavens, and at the same time, his mantle is descending. So as he went up, the power of God's That's work came down. This mantle was now available for Elisha, the prophet, to do the work that Elijah had previously been doing. In a similar fashion, Jesus, after his crucifixion and resurrection, ascended into heaven. And after he went up, the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost in order to give the people of God the power that was needed in order to do the work of God on earth. Through this, we see in Elisha a type of the church. Empowered to do the work of God on earth. Specifically in the stories we're about to read. Elisha is empowered to perform miracles that transform death into life. So in this situation, Elisha represents the, the people of God. Empowered by the Holy Spirit of God in order to do the work of God. But also in a, in a, in a typological way, he also represents really the Lord producing that life on the inside of people. When we speak of resurrection, we most commonly focus on the physical resurrection of Jesus. And those of us who maybe have studied a little bit deeper into the word of God have also connected that to our own resurrection. Let me just say this. I'm not preaching on the rapture this morning, but that's really what the word rapture means. It means resurrection. Because, see, on that day, according to the book of Thessalonians, there's going to be a shout from the archangel. The trumpet of God is going to sound. And then those that are dead in Christ are going to rise. That means those that have died believing in Jesus, hallelujah, are going to receive a resurrection. Yes. And then those of us that remain, just like Elijah and Enoch were brought up before tasting death. Those of us that remain will go to meet them in the air and there we shall be with the Lord Forevermore. So the word rapture is synonymous with resurrection. Uh, and, and, and I just want you to know that there's going to be, a, that there is a physical resurrection. Hallelujah. And, and Jesus even said that when it comes to resurrection. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick. We're going to turn to the book of John. And we're going to look at John chapter 11 because I want you to know who's got the power of resurrection. Hallelujah. Jesus said unto Martha, he said, your brother will rise again. Now, I don't know if you remember the story or not, but Lazarus was Jesus' friend. There was this time frame where he had heard that his friend had died and Jesus waited. And listen, they were waiting for Jesus to come and to pray for him that, he would, that he, his sickness would be recovered. But he didn't and he died and he's now been in the tomb. And Jesus is monitoring the behavior of everyone and they're all crying and they're sad because they've experienced death in their family. And Jesus says to her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And Martha says unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, listen, this is very important that you understand this about Jesus and the power that is in him. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die do you believe this? See, I wanted you to I wanted you to see that Jesus had he is resurrection. Amen. He has the power of resurrection in him. And 2 Corinthians 4:14 teaches us that because he rose, we also will rise. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 4 verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord teaches us that, that you that are in Christ, that you have, that have made a decision of faith to believe in the shedding of his blood, to believe in the sacrificial lamb, that you have been purchased back and that you do not have to face an eternal death, which is separation from the presence of God, but instead you can receive eternal life. You can experience Resurrection power, but I have to tell you that resurrection life and power is more than just a future concept that will deliver us from physical death. Resurrection life is a spiritual truth for today, a truth that states when we died with him through faith, we also resurrected with him into new life. And in this new life, we have access to resurrection power of the Holy Spirit that will enable us to live for God today. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 6. Verses 8 through 11 real quick. Romans 6 verses 8 through 11 says this. Now if we be dead with Christ. So that means that we experience the death with him. Through faith. 
I got to tell you that whenever you put faith, if you have not put faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm not talking about just, oh, my mama said that, you know, Jesus was real and I grew up believing. No, no, no. At some point in time, the adult mind has to come to, to the reality that he is a sinner. She is a sinner and that God has a plan for sinners. And that the plan was that he would send a lamb and the lamb's name was Jesus. And that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin, to pay for your sin. And if you have not received that, the word of God says in Romans 10, that you must believe it in your heart, not in your head. Right. I mean, first you got to believe it in your head before you can believe it in your heart. Right. But you got to believe it in your heart. That's talking about your inner man. You got to believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth that Jesus Christ died for your sin, that he rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. And if you will believe that, you will be saved. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that before this message is over. But what it's saying right here is this, is that if you have believed, hallelujah, then that's what happened. In the mind of God, the old man that was born of Adam, born in sin, has died with Jesus at Calvary. You became one with him. And if you died with him, then you should also live with him. I'm talking about today. I'm talking about resurrection power today to fill you up, to strengthen you, to empower you to do the work of the Lord. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. Listen, I just know that from, from past times of looking into this particular scripture, this word in the Greek is curio. It means Lord. Death is not his Lord. Death is not the master over Jesus. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. And he has the power. He told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He has the power within him to give resurrection life to you today. I got good news for you. You don't have to fear death. I'm not about physical death. Only the Holy Spirit can do a work in your heart and in your mind to convince you that physical death, that, it, that it's not a bad thing, but that, I mean, it, all human beings have to face it and that ultimately there is a resurrection. And the Apostle Paul said that to be for absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. But I got good news for you until that day comes. Whenever that day comes, the Bible says no man is promised tomorrow. That until that day comes, you can have resurrection power today. For in that he died, verse 10, he died once unto sin, but in that he lives, he lives unto God. Yes. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're talking about, see right now, I think the majority of my message really is about that. I want you to know it's about resurrection power today. I want you to, I want you to get... An idea of my message this morning is about resurrection power today. Look at Philippians. This is yes, Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. I'm just going to take my time this morning. I've been taking my time anyway. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to study the scripture with you this yes. morning. Amen. Yes. Look at this. What things were gained to me. Those I count a loss for Christ. What he's saying is, is that I had a whole lot of accomplishments. He said I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. I was on the fast track. He was ready to be a leader in the Pharisaical movement. That means a religious leader. What could you say? You could say, well, you know what? Uh, I have a bunch of degrees. I have uh, I'm a very prestigious member of the community. I'm just saying if you were that. I'm not saying that I'm that. I'm saying if you were a prestigious member of the community, if you had big financial bank accounts, if you drove a Mercedes, one of those Mercedes AMG cars, boy, those things are nice. All these things that show you that you have prestige and then all of a sudden you gave your life to Jesus Christ and the old man that was alive died and was buried with Jesus and a new man was resurrected the newness of life and now all of a sudden because of your stance for Jesus you lost your community uh, your your elevated position in the community you lost your position at the job you your your Mercedes Benz AMG was uh was taken away from you and you no longer had these things but the apostle Paul said oh I count all those things that I've lost for Christ, hallelujah, all that gain that I had in the world, yes, it, it, it doesn't mean anything compared to what I've gained in Christ. 
You look at verse 8, he says, yes, doubtless, and I counted all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I can have all of these things that the world offers me, but if I never had the true knowledge of knowing Jesus, listen, something radical happened to this man. Right. Something radical happened to him and true salvation is a radical work that takes place in the heart and reveals to the heart and the spirit of man that this is real. And to know Jesus is such an honor. To be able to have the knowledge of Jesus Christ is an honor spiritually to have the eyes awakened to the truth of God. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb. So the things that he lost... He's saying, basically, I'm just going to translate for it, a pile of poop. <laughs> All those things that I lost, when I look back at them, it's just a pile of poop. Yeah. Compared to knowing Jesus, it's just a pile of poop. Amen. That I might win Christ because above all else, i got to know Jesus. Yeah. And not just to know him, but I need to be found in him. Talking about, well, look, whenever one day things go bad, I want to be found in Christ. Not having my own righteousness. Don't try to stand before God in your own righteousness, child of God. Don't try to earn your way into heaven. Don't try to think you can do a whole lot of good stuff in order to be right in the eyes of God. No, Jesus did all the right stuff for the Father. And he died in place of you. And if you will put your faith in him, he will clothe you with his righteousness. Hallelujah. And for the first time of your life, you will look pure in the eyes of the Father. But it won't be because of what you did. Because all your stuff is a pile of poop. All my stuff is a pile of poop. I'm going to put myself in that. And instead, but you can receive as the gift, the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. Which is not my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Look at this. This is where I really wanted to bring you right here. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being made conformable unto his death. You know, to be conformed means to be molded into an image. The image that we receive of Jesus was that he was selfless, that he was sacrificial in his love, that he laid himself down, hallelujah. And what I need you to know is this, is that when the power of the resurrection starts to hit your life, it's going to start to conform you. It's going to start to mold you. And it's going to start to make you realize that it's not all about you, hallelujah, and it's about Jesus living his life through you. That's what the word of God teaches. Oh, no, that's just your job, preacher. No, ma'am, no, sir. The true child of God that yields himself and surrenders to the will of God will live for Jesus in such a way that he also becomes a prophetic mouthpiece for the kingdom of God. Will we all stand behind the pulpit? No. But let me tell you something. God will open up doors with your friends, with your family members, and he will allow you to give testimony to the truth that Jesus has entered in and changed your life. If by any th means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Basically, he's saying, I need this resurrection power today so that I know that one day, hallelujah, I will resurrect. Amen. With those concepts in mind, both spiritual and physical uh, death being replaced with life and also the fact that God wants us to have spiritual life today, not just eternal life tomorrow. Now I want to actually read to you the passages that our text is going to come from in 2 Kings. So we're going to be in 2 Kings. If you have your Bibles at home, then I would recommend that you get your Bibles ready. Amen. I'm over here struggling to find 2 Kings. Here we go. 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Now listen, I, I kind of kept some uh, scriptures to where you would be able to, uh, where we're just going to kind of flow through the story. So there's some missing, but basically 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8. But I want you to know if you happen to have a notebook, if you like to study the Bible more deeply, I recommend you take some notes because I'm going to give you some surface stuff that you could dig a whole lot deeper on. And I know some of you brothers and sisters out there text me, hey, give me something to study. Well, look, there's going to be a whole lot of stuff you can study out of this message because we're just going to hit the surfaces. Amen. You ready? Here we go. We're going to read 2 Kings 4, 8. It fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem. This was an area that was a little bit south of the Sea of Galilee, a little bit southwest of the Sea of Galilee, and where was a great woman. I mean, she had money, she had power, and she was constrained, she constrained him to eat bread. In other words, she pleaded with him, hey, won't you stop over here and eat bread with me, man of God? 
And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. We've, we've already sat down and we've ate bread with him. And she says, let us make a little chamber, a little bedroom. Let us make a bedroom, I pray you, or I'm pleading with you, now my husband, uh, up on the, it says on the wall, that's King James, but it, they had a little flat part to their roof. Let us make him a little bedroom on the flat part of our roof connected to our house. And let us set there for him a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he comes to us that he shall turn in here. Let's make this a comfortable place for the man of God to come and to spend time with us. We're going to get into that a little bit more, but let's go ahead and scroll to verse 12. And we'll read through verse 14. And he said to Gehazi, now this is Elisha, the prophet talking. Gehazi is his servant. So this is after a period of time that this Shunammite woman and her husband, they've built a bedroom for Gehazi and Elisha. They're feeding him bread every time he passes by. They're spending time. They're in communion. They're in fellowship with him. And so now after a while, Elisha realizes, man, this woman has really been kind to us. Let's see if there's something that she would like the Lord to do for her, right? And so that's what he says to his servant Gehazi. I call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him and he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us. Another way we could say that is you've been very kind to us. You've been very thoughtful for us with all this care that you've given us. What is to be done for you now? Would you be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she said, I, answer, I dwell among my own people. I don't, basically, she said, I don't need all that. I don't need to be elevated in the eyes of government. Look, and I'm happy with where I am. He said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily, she has no child and her husband is old. You see, the desire of every Jewish woman back in those days was to be able to have offspring, especially a son, because they all hoped for and longed for the day that the promise of God would come regarding the Messiah, regarding the promised one. And it was a desire that all of these women would have. And we know that that ended up resting upon uh, Mary. Amen? Amen. But 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, verse Set, we're going to scroll down to verse 17 now. And the woman conceived and she bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of her life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. In other words, he went into the field to help his father reap the harvest. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, another young man, carry the boy to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then he died. Now, for every mother that might be listening to this message, I know that I can't even imagine if you really stop and you think about it, you try to put your place in there, right, empathetically to try to feel what she feels. Only a mom can feel that right now. Right. You know, now that that would bring me forward in time. I'm not it's not even in my notes, but I'm just mentioning what the mother of Jesus must have felt like on the day that they hung him on the cross and scourged him and beat him. But nevertheless, for any mom in the audience, you should be able to, to be able to experience and understand a little bit of that for yourself. Now, so the boy's dead. Now we're going to transition to verse 25. So she went and came unto the man of God. So now she's like, she's desperate and she needs to find the prophet. And he was at Mount Carmel and it came to pass when the man of God sir, saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi, his servant, behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Now we're going to go to verse 32. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door upon them twain or two. In other words, it was just him and the boy in the room. And he prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and he lay upon the child. And he put his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child 
waxed warm. Verse 35. Then he returned and he walked in the house to and fro, went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Now, real quick, I didn't even put this in my notes, but I need you to know the number seven always describes the fulfilled or the completed work of God. God created for six days. On the sixth day, he created his prized creation, which was mankind. On the seventh day, God rested. That's where we get the Sabbath from. It describes the fulfillment and the completed work of God. Therefore, God rested. Therefore, when any man enters into the rest of God, he has no more work to do. Now the work is a work of faith to believe in God because Jesus is the true rest of God. Hallelujah. It's not what day you go to church. It's not you go to church on a Saturday versus a Sunday. Jesus is the Sabbath. Jesus is your rest. Jesus said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and you will find rest for your weary soul. Maybe you're out here today with all of this stuff going on in this global crisis and you find yourself trying to work, work, work in all kind of ways to try to make all the pain alleviate all the problems and you just find yourself getting more and more stressed. I'm here to tell you, Jesus wants you to allow that spiritual stress to be placed upon him. Amen. Cat, that's what the word of God says. In the letter to Peter, he says, casting your care. Cast your, throw your anxieties upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He wants to carry your burden for you this morning. Maybe you don't know, but this is, I'm just trying to tell you, this is a completed work. And this boy came back to life. Amen. Solid. This boy came back to life. Now let's go ahead and scroll to verse 38. And Elisha came again to Gilgal. Now this is a completely different story. I told you there were two stories that I wanted to preach from. This, this is a transition. Now, Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth or a famine in the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot. In other words, get a big old pot and put it on the fire. And sieve or cook pottage. In other words, I need you to cook me a stew for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds. His lap was full of it and he came and he shred them into the pot of pottage for they knew them not. They did not realize these were wild gourds or that there was a problem connected to it. So they poured out for the men to eat and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, O oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. I forgot to tell you the title of my message this morning. It wasn't going to make sense until I got to the spot right here. The title of my message this morning is pour some flour in the pot. And that's what it says in verse 41. But he said then bring some meal. That word meal doesn't mean bring a meal like a plate of food. It means bring some flour. Bring some flour and cast it into the pot. It almost sounds like they're cooking a gumbo and they're making a roux. If you're from South Louisiana, you know what I'm talking about. But that's not really what's going on here. Bring some flour, throw it into the pot. And he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but I'm here to tell you that no matter what your pot looks like. Listen, you can put some flour in your pot. Amen. Yes, and it's going to make everything Better. The topic today is resurrection life and the fact that God's plan brought life through the death of Jesus. And considering the enormity of God's plan through life and the death of Jesus, considering this plan is very humbling for me. And that I begin to realize that his plan affects the smallest of individuals and the most powerful of nations also. In the end, the plan of God, this simple thought of his willingness to transform death into life by offering the life of Jesus in death so that man could be united with Jesus into his death and in turn be a recipient of his resurrection life has so, such far-reaching implications for both the individual and the globe that it's simply overwhelming. Look at Revelation chapter 21 verse 5 and 7. I love this scripture because listen, this is at the end. This is, to, this is at the end. This is after all the chaos. And listen, there's coming a day when this world is no longer, there's no more going to be tears. There's no more going to be pain. 
There's no more going to be sorrow. Hallelujah. Because God's going to make it all right. And in order to make it right, Jesus had to come and to make it right for the Father. But he's done his work. And now we're just waiting for the completion. But one day it will be completed. And this is Jesus. And he's seated upon, seated upon the throne. And he said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write unto me. He said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. I have good news for you this morning. Jesus came to make all things new. Amen. So what I'm trying to tell you is. In a, in a roundabout way, when you put flour in the pot, he just didn't put it in for them boys around the campfire. He didn't just put it in for you as an individual. He put flour in the pot for the whole world that one day everything can be made new and that we can rule and reign with Jesus during the millennial reign of Christ and that God can completely defeat the enemy, hallelujah, and that his power will be no more. He came to make all things new. A world riddled with sin, darkness, it pervaded the atmosphere. Men's hearts had been turned away from God. The song, I'm telling you, I don't ever talk to these people about these songs. And the song said that she sang, said, we walked away from God. And here it is in my text. Men's hearts had been turned away from God because the darkness of sin had entered their hearts. And they loved the darkness more than they loved the light. And they stayed away from the light because they didn't want their sinfulness exposed. But Jesus, the light of God and love of God, came to the earth to bring the light of God into this earth in order to dispel the darkness and allow God's light to shine. And darkness tried to hide the light. Yes. And darkness tried to stop the work of God upon this earth. Yeah. But for sake of time, John 1, 4 through 5 says this, In him was life. The light was the light of men. The light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Some translations in the Greek, it says instead of comprehended it, which would mean to understand, said apprehended it not. In other words, darkness could not overtake the light of God. Hallelujah. The enemy tried. Yeah. He tried to overtake the light of God. He tried to destroy the plan of God. But I'm here to tell you, whether it looks like it to you or not, whether it looks like it to your co-worker or not, Jesus overcame death, hell, and the grave, overcame the forces of evil. And I'm here to tell you, he rose as a conquering king. Hallelujah. And he has victory to give to his people. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. For thousands of years, both Jewish believers before Jesus came to earth and Christian believers after Jesus came to earth have wondered, when will he really put a stop to evil? When will he put a stop to death? When will all this come to an end? And when will what we have been believing be made obvious for all to see? Don't you long for that as a Christian? Yeah. Even serving Jesus, I don't know about you, but people have mocked me. People have mocked me whenever I've spoken about the Lord and, and, and witnessed to other people. They have mocked me and they've made fun. Hallelujah. But listen, the word of God says to rejoice in that day that they make fun of you and that they mock you for the case of Christ. Amen. Amen. Great is your reward in heaven. Nevertheless, I can't wait for the day. Not that I want them to be judged. I hope that they would get saved before because that's the spirit of God. That they would humble themselves and that they would give their life to Jesus. Maybe you're watching and you say, man, some of my family members have been mocking me. Just hold on to Jesus, brother, sister. Don't, don't let your family members turn you away from the Lord. I was having a conversation with a brother the other day, and he was like, man, Jesus said, unless you hate your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, you cannot have, be part of me. Jesus don't want us hate nobody. His point is, if your brother, your sister, your mother, your daddy, your friend are going to prevent you from following after me, you better forsake them and hold on to me. Listen to me. Don't grab a hold and hug on to your family and your friends if they're trying to turn your heart away from Jesus. They ain't shed their blood for you. You want to talk about blood being thicker than water? Ain't no blood gets thicker than the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. It wants to cover you. It wants to call you righteous. And it wants to give you opportunity to serve the Lord. He said, I make all things new. He said, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. You know, for so long and in many ways, the world has been convinced that Jesus had no power. 
So injustices just keep occurring. God's people keep experiencing suffering. They even mock the king himself. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Let's go. Let's just at least cover a little bit of this of this great scene of our king. Amen. That died on on on, uh, you know, before he rose from the dead. Amen. Look at this. Matthew 27 verse 40. We're going to read through verse 42 and saying that thou. So this is Jesus. He's hanging on the cross and he's suffering in death. And then the religious leaders in the world are walking by and they're mocking. See, if you've ever been mocked for your witness for the Lord, listen, Jesus hung naked on a cross and they clowned him from the ground. They looked at him and they laughed at him and they mocked him and they ridiculed him as he was nailed to that cross. And that's what they said. They said, you who said that you would destroy the temple and build it back in three days, save yourself. If you be the son of God, come down from the cross. Now, listen, they want to try to say that Jesus was lying. And I'm here to tell you when Jesus was talking about the temple of God. Listen, this gets kind of deep. But if you got your notebook, like I said, you got a pen, write it down. God has been preparing to bring his presence back to his people for thousands of years. He started off with something called a tent. It was a tabernacle in the Old Testament. He said in Exodus 25, 8, build me a tabernacle so that my presence might dwell with my people. And in that tent, there was a, something called the Holy of Holies. And there was a curtain that hung between it. Yeah. And the presence of God was behind that curtain. Jesus said, I'll, de this, I'll destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days because ultimately what he's talking about, see behind that curtain was an Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God would meet with Israel. And what Jesus was saying is, I am the fulfillment of the temple. Destroy me and my resurrection in three days will rebuild the true temple of God, which will allow the presence of God to enter into every man so that he can have fellowship with me. Jesus's death, him laying down his life and receiving resurrection life again, allows the life of God to not be closed in a room anymore, but instead for it to live on the inside of you and have a personal relationship with you. And the presence of God in the midst of your life can bring hope. And to bring healing in your life. Hallelujah. 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 Let's look at verse 41. Likewise, also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot be saved. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. They wanted a miracle that they could see so they could believe. You know, a lot of times people will say that. Well, they, people just need to see a miracle. Hold on a second. The world might be running around looking for a, something that they can see. They want to say, give me something that I can see with my eyes and then I will believe. Can I tell you that God wants to give you something that you can see and one day he will give you something that you will be able to see with your eyes. But today he wants you to be able to see what resurrection life can do for you today. How it can transform you from spiritual death to spiritual life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 27 verses 50 through 53. It says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. In other words, he released his spirit and he allowed himself to die. And look at this. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent. Yes. In twain or ripped in two from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks also were split in two. I just want to take just a moment to, to make a comment that I told you about that tent that was made in the book of Exodus. And ultimately there was a temple that was made. Amen. And during the time frame of Jesus, that temple was expanded on by King Herod. But it still had the same concept. A room in the back with the Ark of the Covenant. With a veil or a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, the place where the presence of God dwelled, from the people on the outside. Now Josephus, the Jewish scholar, says that that curtain was actually embroidered material that was the width of a man's hand. And that two yoke of oxen couldn't pull it apart. The word of the Lord tells us that it was split and ripped from the top to the bottom. The point to that was that were wanted that God wanted you and I to know that man didn't rip this curtain, but instead God ripped this curtain. When Jesus died and he gave up the spirit 
and he died as the sacrificial lamb, he opened up the doorway, that partition that previously prevented you and I from accessing the presence of God was moved out of the way. I got good news for you this morning. Maybe you have never experienced the presence of God, but all of the hindrances have been moved out of the way, and your faith in Christ this morning can bring you into a place where you can receive resurrection power Amen. to strengthen you. Amen. And to do the work in you. Look at this. Verse 52. And the graves were open. This is the power of Calvary. Yeah. The graves were open. And many bodies of the saints yeah. which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. Look, the veil of the temple was ripped, signifying you have access. Graves started popping open. People came to life. The power of his death brought new life. It will cause the, both the spiritually and the physically dead yes. to raise yes. to life again. Think about that. Not only was his tomb empty, but there were other empty tombs, others who were dead that were raised to life. That is the resurrection power of God. That is the fruit of the power of his sacrificial death. That is the fruit of the sin debt for mankind being paid. He wanted people to be ready before this, even before this day happened. He wanted people to be ready. He wanted people to be able to believe that is why he resurrected Lazarus from the grave before he resurrected so that people's hearts would be ready to accept the fact that he had power over death and the grave. Listen, for sake of time, if you're taking notes, you can write it down. John 11, 39 through 45. I just want to tell you the story. I mentioned it already. Whenever I told you about Martha and Jesus said, I am the resurrection of the life. But Jesus finally shows up. He sees all of the people crying and weeping. And the Bible says Jesus wept. Because see, Jesus is your great high priest. He's experienced the pain that you've experienced. He knows how you feel when you lose loved ones. He understands the pain of death. He understands what sin has caused to the earth. That's why he is a faithful high priest. And he was tempted in all points as we are. He was tested in his humanity. And he came out tried and true on the other side. Amen. But he told him, he said, he said, remove the rock. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Yeah. The word of the Lord says in verse 44 that he came, he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. Now I got to tell you something. Physically, Lazarus was dead. Jesus raised him physically from the dead. But I want you to understand something. I'm talking about a spiritual Resurrection for your life this morning. I'm talking about you might be breathing air and your heart may be pumping, but that doesn't mean that you're alive. I remember one time my friend Robert told me back whenever I was doing my time when I was incarcerated, the Lord was doing a work on the inside of me and I felt more life than I could have ever experienced in a hundred years. I was so full of life. The Lord actually gave it. He said there was an opportunity for him to leave in a couple of months time. And instead he took another option that said that he might have to stay in there another three years. He knew that the Lord didn't tell him to move on yet. And he, and he made the decision that could have made him stay another three. He said, oh, you can't even explain that. That's the Holy Spirit doing a work and showing me just sit still and know that I am God. In the midst of all that, when he got out, he, he ended up saying to one of his family members, all I know to tell you is, is that I've been more alive in there than you've been alive out here. Wow. Because I have experienced the life of Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you that maybe this morning you feel dead. But I'm here to tell you that there's hope. Because even though Lazarus, when he came out, look at the grave. The grave tried to cling to him. The grave clothes tried to cling to him. He couldn't walk properly. I mean, I'm not trying to be silly. But was he hopping around like a mummy? I don't know what he looked like. But the grave clothes were still on him. He couldn't use his arms properly to work for God. His feet couldn't carry him where he needed to go. He had a napkin over his face. He couldn't see. Jesus said, loose him and set him free. I'm here to tell you this morning that God wants to loose you spiritually and set you free so that your feet can carry you where God calls you to go. So that your hands can be released to do the work of the Lord and God wants you to be able to see spiritually, through spiritual eyes. He wants you to be able to see what it is that he's called you to do. So we're about to transition back to the second king stories. We're getting near the end of the message. Just hang tight with me. But I got four points to give you. It says resurrection life brings us closer to God.
The resurrection is where God transfers his life to the dead. The resurrection reminds me that man has a problem with death, but Resurrection Sunday reminds me that the giving of his life was the remedy for death. Here's point number one. You ready? I already read it to you, so I'm not even going to go back. But in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, the scripture said this. It said, it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem where it was a great woman and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was is that as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat bread. Then to go a couple verses down and it says she spoke to her husband and she said, please, let's build him a bedroom. Let's build him a bedroom and put him a bed and give him a table so that he'll feel comfortable. And now when he comes towards us, he will turn in here to stay with us. Listen to me. I got to tell you something. Eating bread and sleeping in the home of someone else denoted a deep level of commitment and communion in ancient times. This woman, like a wise believer, wanted to be close to the presence of God. She wanted to have communion with God. The risen Christ reminds us that we have a relationship with a living God. If a person is truly saved, they know without a doubt that God is real. Why? Because the presence of God through the Holy Spirit has come to live in their hearts. I want to tell you in this particular scripture right here in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 this is one of my favorite scriptures to talk about to let you know whether or not you are truly saved or not. I'm telling you right now I know what the word of God says believe in your heart confess with your mouth. There's been many of people I believe though that believed that thought they were believing with their heart but they were really only believing with their head. If you truly believe with your heart then a miracle has taken place in your heart. And this is what the scripture says, that in whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth. Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? Listen to me. If you have truly gotten saved, that means the Holy Spirit has come to live in your heart. That's what this woman was wanting to do. She was wanting to feed the man of God bread. She wanted to have communion with him. She wanted to build a bedroom with him, up for him, so that he could stay there because she wanted to have close connection to him. The word of God says in John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man loves me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come into him and we will make our abode with him. He's talking about a dwelling place. Yes. Jesus died on the cross and resurrected from the dead so that you and I, could live with them so that we could dwell with them so that we could have relationship and communion with him. That was point number one. He came so we could live with him and it describes closeness with God. Point number two. In resurrection life, the spirit transfers the life of God to the dead. In 2 Kings 4, 32 through 35, what was said was this. When Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, he shut the door upon the two of them, and he prayed unto the Lord. And he went up, and he lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. This is what I wanted to start. This was the point again. In resurrection life, the spirit transfers the life of God to the dead. In a similar fashion to the way that God originally brought life to the human race, through blowing his breath of life into the nostrils of Adam, Elisha placed his mouth upon this boy, and resurrection power entered in, and new life began. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says this, If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead would dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken or bring life to your mortal or human bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. That's talking about not just tomorrow for a physical resurrection. That's talking about today. You might have woke up this morning. You might not even put your clothes on yet. That's fine. You can do that in this, in this church setting. But listen, it's not okay to stay in your jammies uh, for the next two months. No, you're going to get up. Wash your hair, clean your face, put your clothes back on, because you got to get to walking for the Lord, amen? You got to let God quicken your mortal body. You got to let God give life yeah. unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's extremely important Hallelujah. to our walk with God that we understand that everything has to be accomplished through a work of the Spirit in us. 
Spirit of God gives resurrection life to us and God will produce a resurrection in areas of our lives that were previously dead. I don't want to lose my point on that, but I want to say some of you out there are like, yeah, brother, come on, man. I, 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 I'm working from the house. I'm doing conference calls. I can stay in my jammies if I want to. Listen, that's not what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Just get up and move. Let the Lord do a work on the inside of you, not to be beaten down with depression in the midst of chaos is what I'm yes, saying. Lord. Come on. Hallelujah. The Spirit gives resurrection life to us. God will produce a resurrection. I want to make this point. God will produce a resurrection in areas of our lives that were previously dead. I know there's no hope, preacher. I've been dealing with this situation for so long. I've even prayed and I've asked God to help me. No, I'm here to tell you God will bring life in an area of your uh, resurrection life to an area of your life that was previously dead. Here's my illustration. When a person has a heart attack, it's because a coronary artery is clogged up with plaque. The coronary arteries in the heart provide oxygenated blood flow throughout the heart muscle so that it can stay alive. When the artery gets completely blocked, the oxygenated blood flow stops and the muscle on the other side of the clot begins to die. There are many more superior ways nowadays, but in some hospitals, they still use a clot busting drug called TPA. IV TPA is infused, the clot is dissolved, oxygenated blood flow is restored, and a place that was dying is now again receiving life. When the resurrection life of Jesus through the presence of the Holy Spirit begins to have its way in the life of the believer, places where a person was previously incapable are infused with the life-giving power of God, and now suddenly they are capable. You were incapable, but now all of a sudden you're capable. That is the greatest miracle that you will ever experience in your life. I'm telling you right now, when you will know deep down in your knower that God showed up and did something for you that you could not do for yourself. Oh, preacher, you don't understand. I keep going back to the same thing. That's exactly why he died, so that you could be infused with resurrection power, so that that clot could be busted, so that the life force of the Holy Ghost could move into that area, hallelujah, and restore life even though death was trying to be there. I can't be a good father, hallelujah, infusion of life in that area of your life. I can't be a good husband, hallelujah, infusion of life. God, but listen, there's got to be a surrender in our life. There's got to be a surrender when we'll allow the Holy Ghost to do a work on the inside of us. I can't be a good provider. Uh, I, there, you know, there's a spiritual stronghold sometimes. Listen, we're in a different kind of economy right now, man. People can't even get a job. But I'm talking about what about all the time that we had a good economy? And people still could. Because sometimes we're plagued with a spirit that prevents us from being able to get up. Where you couldn't be a good provider before and there was a part of you that wanted to be. I'm telling you right now, the infusing power of the Holy Ghost can bring resurrection life in that area and get you to stand up. You'd be the best worker on the job. I'd be calling you up, man. When are you coming back? We need you over here. Hallelujah. One more thing to note about this new life illustrated by Elisha in this miracle. Remember, he laid... On top of him, I believe he breathed that life, man. The Lord, just like the Lord breathed life into Adam, I believe that that's what was happening. The transference of the life of the Holy Spirit got into that little boy. One thing I want you to know, though, is this. His hands were on the boy's hands. His eyes were on the boy's eyes. True resurrection for life today means that the old me that, that lived for self and died and a new man is resurrected so that Jesus can live through me. That's Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live by faith in the one who loved me and he gave him self for me. Lazarus was freed from his grave clothes and made able to walk and work and see. Now Elisha's eyes are on the boy's eyes. His hands are on the boy's hands. The resurrection power of God gives me his eyes and hands so I can begin to see what he sees and do the work that he wants done. That was Point number two, he brings life where there was death. Amen. Point number three, death is the fruit of sin and resurrection life is the fruit of the cross. Hallelujah. In verse 39, it said, and one went out into the field and he gathered herbs. He found a wild vine and he gathered thereof wild gourds. His lap was full. He came and he shredded them in the pot of stew 
and they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass as they were eating the pottage that they cried out and said, Oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. This gourd vine was wild. It wasn't cultivated. It wasn't good. The result of it was death. Vines are a very common theme in the Bible. They represent growth. Sometimes the growth is good and produces life. Sometimes the growth is bad. And like this vine results in death. I give you a couple of examples. We're not going to turn to them for time. But in Jeremiah 2.21, Jeremiah says Israel is like a rebellious vine. He said, yet yeah, this is God talking. I planted you a noble vine. When I planted you, I planted you good. You can go back all the way to the garden. When I created you, I created you good. All things were done. God said, it is good. He says, I planted you like a good vine, holy, a right seed. How then are you turned into a degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? You're growing in the opposite direction of what I called you to do. That's not how I planted you. That's not how I created you. That's the human race. That's the nation of Israel in their rebellion. That's the human race going in its own direction. Revelation 14, 18 and 19. Another vine. Yes, it's a cluster of grapes, but it's a vine. It says, and another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. That's not talking about the rapture. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and he cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. One day judgment is going to come upon this earth. The vine of the world is uncultivated. It's degenerate. It's going in a wrong direction. It represents the sinful nature. It represents the power of sin over the human race. And one day God is going to judge it and it's going to be destroyed. But listen, God is merciful and he's gracious and he provided a way, hallelujah, that you can be connected to the vine. He planted mankind in the garden as a good vine. Man went his own way. But hallelujah, God sent another vine. And this is it. John chapter 1. This is worth turning to right here. I said John chapter 1 is John 15. Hallelujah. John 15, 1 and 2. Jesus says, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. What is a husbandman? He takes care of vines. He prunes them. He takes, he waters them. He makes sure that they're fertilized. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. That means he prunes it to make sure that it's getting all the flow it needs, all the attention that it needs, that it may bring forth more fruit. Look at down to verse five. I am the vine. Jesus is saying this. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Listen to me. You may not think this is a resurrection message or a resurrection verse, but I'm here to tell you, no, it is a resurrection verse. Let me tell you why. How did you get connected to the vine to begin with? Because Jesus died on the cross to set you free. How did you get plugged into the vine? Because somebody told you the good news of Jesus dying to set you free. You believed it by faith. Supernaturally in the spiritual realm, God stuck you in the vine. He planted you in the vine. You're a new branch that's been grafted in. Hallelujah. And now you're receiving the flow of God. You're no longer a degenerate vine. You're now connected to the vine. And through the vine, the presence of the Holy Spirit flows like sap into the branch that's been, that's been grafted in. Hallelujah. And it begins to produce Fruit. He went on to say that he said, listen, if you abide in me, if you live in this place, if you stay here in, in, the, in the sacrifice and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you will produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse four, we're closing with this. Second Kings chapter four, verse 40 says, oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof, but he said, then bring the flour. And he cast it into the pot and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. The problem was what the wild vine caused death. The answer for the death was to place meal or flour into the pot. And the result was that the flour cured the poison and transformed death into life. Wow. Now, 
I don't have time to go there, but I'm going to tell you, if you got your notes, you can write it down, Leviticus chapter 2. The whole chapter of Leviticus 2, it calls it the meat offering, or it can be called the meal offering. That might be confusing in old King James language, but it's talking about flour. It's talking about flour that doesn't have leaven. Leaven is yeast, and it corrupts it. Leaven is a type of sin. This is talking about a flour offering that is given to God, and it's mingled with oil. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. This flour that's without yeast, without sin, is representative of the body of Jesus. What they poured into that pot was the light, the sinless life of Jesus. Amen. Jesus was like that Levitical offering and the meal offering in Leviticus chapter 2. He had no sin in him. It was without blemish. It was without leaven. And he offered up his sinless life in place of you. I don't know what you feel like you're going through today. You may be saying to me, listen, Jesus said this in Revelation 1.18. I am he that lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus has authority over hell and death. Why? Because he offered up his sinless, unleavened life like that flower was as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus had no sin. Therefore, death could not hold him down. And he resurrected to newness of life. And now he has authority over death. Maybe some of you this morning are saying this. I'm watching this video and I'm thinking right now while you're preaching, preacher, I'm a wild vine and there's death in the pot. I've got good news for you. You can pour that unleavened flour of Jesus Hallelujah. into the pot and the result Hallelujah. will be resurrection life. If that's you this morning and you're saying, yes, I want Jesus today, I just want you to pray with me. Hallelujah. I want to say a prayer with you. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just lift up, Lord God, every single person that's watched this video, that will watch this video. And I pray that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit in the heart and in the life. Lord, this world is abounding in chaos. People are experiencing pain. But I pray that you would move right now in the hearts and the minds of your people. Lord God, that you would begin to reveal to them that you are the flower that they need in the midst of this chaos. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for Calvary. Lord, we thank you that you are the lamb like the song sung that, relieved, that purchased the souls of men. Who would have ever thought that a lamb could purchase the souls of men? Oh, the precious blood of Jesus, that crimson flow. Lord Jesus, right now we just pray that the heart of, these, uh, the heart of your people, Lord God, would respond to the gospel and that they would say right now, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. But I believe that you're the one that was sent to die on the cross for my sin. So I'm inviting you in right now in the name of Jesus. Would you come into my heart, please? And would you forgive me of my sin? I believe it today. I believe the resurrection is real. That's why I even tuned in to listen to somebody preach on this day. I believe the resurrection is real. If you believe the resurrection is real, then you believe that Jesus died on the cross. And he paid for every sin. And you believe that the God, that the Father accepted that sacrifice. Because had he not, Jesus would have never rose from the dead. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, just as the sun rises on a new day, Lord God, that your spirit right now would yes. rise in the hearts, Lord God, of people that would have prayed this prayer. Even maybe there's people that have been turned away from you, Lord. They know you. They've been saved before, but they've been walking in another direction. I pray, Lord God, that you would allow that sunrise of Jesus, the light of Jesus, the resurrection power to rise on the inside of their heart. Yes. Lord, I pray that you would go with your people this week. And that no matter, we don't know what hope tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Yes. I pray that you yes. would be with us every step of the way. Yes. That you give us spiritual eyes to see. Yes. And that you would infuse us with your resurrection power so that oh, we could perform yeah. what you've oh. asked us to do, Lord God, upon this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.